Good morning, everyone. Um, it's my great pleasure to um, introduce our grand round speaker today, Dr. Jeff Mewson. And um, he's currently a uh, assistant professor uh, in the lab medicine and pathology department at Mayo Clinic. Um, he's also the co-director of cardiovascular lab medicine and also consultant for the clinical core laboratory services uh, at Mayo Clinic. And so Dr. Jeffrey Mewson that received his um, bachelor degree from University, University of Wisconsin-Madison. And then he did his uh, PhD in chemistry at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. And then, so he then uh, spent five, next five years and did his clinical chemistry fellowship as well as, he, as well as his postdoctoral fellowship at Mayo Clinic. So he thought that he would actually move back to Wisconsin after five years because um, he, that's where he grew up. But then he decided that he actually loved Minnesota so much that he wanted to stay. And so he has been uh, a faculty at Mayo Clinic since 2014. So for the last five years that he has really become an uh, expert that in biomarkers uh, that for cardiovascular disease risk prediction. And so I know Jeff that through AACC, and also I know his work because um, the common interest in plasma lipids. Um, so today that I'm so excited that he's coming here to share us this fascinating story uh, of translating um, biomarker and then uh, for clinical use. So uh, let's welcome Dr. Jeff Newsom. Thanks, Danny, and thank you for the invitation. And while it might have been a little bit tongue-in-cheek, it is true that uh, I did want to go back to Wisconsin. I was born and raised. I'm proud of it. But Minnesota has stolen the heart of myself and my family. So we're here as long as they'll have us. <laughs> Though I am still going to cheer for the Badgers. So today I wanted to spend some time talking about a new test. I, I say new, but we've actually been offering this on a clinical level since 2016, I believe. And it's still new because, at least in the field of cardiovascular um, medicine, I think it takes a while for physician awareness and uptake to, to catch up to the newer biomarkers. And that's probably a good thing. Um, start out by saying I have no relevant relationships with industry. I always figure I would drive a nicer car if I could say I do have anything to disclose, but the testing is performed at Mayo. The clinic laboratories, but I don't directly benefit in any way from that other than they are my employer. So something, if any of you have uh, been able to visit the campus uh, down in Rochester that they um, really take seriously and hold close to our heart is the motto of Mayo Clinic, and that is the needs of the patient come first. So before any other consideration should be thrown in, we want to make sure, is this going to improve our ability to care for a given patient? It was something that was instilled by the founders of the clinic, which are depicted here. They were brothers, Drs. Will and Char Charlie Mayo. And it's something that I hope still holds true today under the decisions we make. And I hope to convince you uh, as we go through some of the data I'm going to present that that is why we think plasma ceramides are a useful biomarker. So I hope to explain what they are, how they were discovered, show you the evidence that exists for the utility, identify who might be tested, and what could be done with those results. So as Danny said, I'm a co-director of cardiovascular lab medicine, which isn't so much a, a four-walled room, but the, the concept of trying to work on tests that would be applicable in the space of cardiovascular disease, which remains the number one cause of death globally. <laughs> Uh, not just in the United States, as it has been since we've been keeping records, but now it's spread to the number one cause of death across the globe. Rates continue to increase of heart attacks and strokes. When we talk about cardiovascular disease, we're talking about the plaque buildup within <laughs> vessels that then leads to a blockage, being a stroke or a heart attack. And the really sad part of this is that there's highly effective therapies. Diet and lifestyle is shown if we can eat better and move more, that we will reduce our risk of having cardiovascular disease. And there's probably 
more evidence around statins than any other drug that's ever been, just as far as the number of randomized clinical trials and, and persons enrolled. The problem is, it's until you have that event, it's really an asymptomatic disease. So we don't really know who's healthy and who's at risk. There's been some studies dating back to the Framingham studies, which we're all uh, aware of probably from the 50s and 60s, that identified uh, certain risk factors. So if you have a history of cardiovascular disease, that puts you at higher risk of recurrent disease, strong family histories, tobacco smoking, is a very strong risk factor, modifiable risk factor uh, for cardiovascular disease, as well as uh, age, gender, ethnicity, hypertension, diabetes, and then I think the most uh, ubiquitous biomarker acknowledged as being associated with the disease would be LDL cholesterol and cardiovascular disease. So if you have increased blood LDL cholesterol, that in increases your risk of having cardiovascular disease. Unfortunately, as many as 20% of people actually have their first event despite having none of those risk factors. So these are data published in JAMA in 2003. There's been another paper uh, in 2016 that had similar findings. And what they did was retrospectively review all the adjudicated MIs that had showed up, uh, I believe this was in Chicago, and looked at their risk factor profile. And it turned out about 20% of them didn't fit any of the risks, uh, risk factors that we currently identify. The good news is at least 40% did have one risk factor, so maybe there have been some heads up or warning to adjust their lifestyle. But it still leaves the, a lot of room for us to try to identify those asymptomatic individuals that are at high risk of having a coronary uh, artery event. And that's where the journey to this new ceramide test began. So the idea of looking for what else could be responsible for risk was something that was uh, being explored by a group out of Finland, their metabolomics company. And they did an untargeted lipid specific study. And they enrolled subjects that had defined coronary artery atherosclerosis. They had already actually had an event at one point. And then they followed those individuals for three years. And anyone that died of a second cardiovascular event was a case and the rest were considered controls. And they were matched based on age, gender, whether or not they were on statin, BMI, and their lipids. So basic lipids meaning their cholesterol levels uh, and triglycerides. And as you can see, there's quite a d few different lipids that they were looking at. So they were looking at cholesterol esters, which is the CEs, ceramides, sphingomyelins, lactoceramides, which are um, just another species that have a sugar moiety attached to them, and looking at the various chain lengths of the hydrocarbons that are associated with all these different sphingolipids and the uh, saturation or unsaturation. So that's sort of what all this nomenclature gets into. And while I'm not the biggest fan of volcano plots, they do a decent job of uh, separating out and visualizing the data. So what we're looking at here is a percent difference between cases and controls along the X, and then the significance of that difference along the Y. And you can see there's quite a few um, lipid species that seem to segregate between those that had an event and those that didn't. LDL cholesterol was, like I said, adjusted for, so it was sort of out of the loop, and actually they did plot it on this at one point and call it out that it's somewhere down here, just because it had been adjusted for, though. And when they came to us with these data and said, we think we're onto something, we want to start measuring an alternate lipid than cholesterol, what do you guys think? We said, yeah, this looks interesting. And after some more discussion, we settled in on three specific ceramides. The reason we chose these was they all seem to be predictive of cases, in this case, um, individuals that would have an event within three years. They all had a similar structure with just a slightly different number of carbon lengths, or, or a slightly different <coughs> number of carbons on their uh, fatty acid chain. And so we thought it would be measurable and, and relatively easy to do as opposed to some of these others that are just completely different structures and it would it'd be more difficult to have a test that encompasses the variety of them. So those three ceramides that we initially identified 
we're now changing the nomenclature and trying to simplify it a little bit just to say that this piece is always the same, the sphingosine part. And so the ceramide is just uh, a, ser a 16 carbon chain length, an 18, a 24 with one unsaturation, and then a 24 with no unsaturation. So these are the four ceramides we were talking about. The three that were increased with disease are listed here, and each was independently linked to a poorer outcome. And we decided we needed to include this fourth ceramide because while it's not actually linked to disease, it is extremely abundant. And it turns out, as we'll show you in later data, that it helps but for uh, intra-individual normalizing since it's the one that is most common in everyone. So before we committed completely to doing the test, we said, okay, we've got, three, we've got some target molecules here that we think we could, that are similar enough that we can make a pretty easy LC mass spec test for. We needed to do some more investigation as far as what is the, the foundational principles and concepts of these being associated with the finding that came up through that untargeted lipidomic study. Well, it turns out ceramides are synthesized in all cells and they're components of membranes and they're signal molecules. And those of you that are familiar with cholesterol might think that this is a similar story. Cholesterol is part of cell membranes in all cells. All cells have the mach enzymatic machinery to make cholesterol. And uh, cholesterol actually is involved in signaling both through the hormone system as well as within cells um, as a signal. And it turns out that ceramides also accumulate in cells, particularly those that aren't designed to store lipids because all cells have the machinery to make it. So the times when the ceramides accumulate is when we have stresses like caloric excess, uh, hyperlipidemia, inflammation, or ischemia. All of these things seem related to and associated with cardiovascular disease and tell a similar story to cholesterol. Just as a quick refresher or, or a crash course for those of you that maybe don't spend your time thinking about atherosclerosis the way I do, um, this is my chemist, not physician, chemist version of how atherosclerosis works. So what we have here is a cross-sectional view of an artery. The blood would be flowing in this space. This would be the, um, the first uh, layer. And then we have the interstitial space, which is non-cellular, but actually contains a lot of collagens and sort of the, the rubber part of the rubber hose. And then we have the smooth muscle that gives the tension on the outer side. So what happens is if we can um, have a, an LDL particle or some sort of lipoprotein flowing through the space infiltrates that fir first endothelial cellular layer and gets trapped in the rubber part. And this is one of the reasons it's uh, um, presumed that uh, smoking and hypertension are such strong risk factors is because they cause vulnerabilities in this endothelial layer and increase the likelihood of lipids being able to cross in and get stuck. Same is true for why increased uh, cl blood cholesterol and blood lipids is a causative of atherosclerosis. Just a concentration dependent process. The more lipoproteins you have in circulation, the more chance they have of infiltrating uh, the membrane wall or the vascular wall. Once they're there, they're perceived as a foreign object. So monocytes that are circling by might end up co uh, coming in to try and deal with it. They can uh, phagocytose and remove those if it's not too big of a deal, but as it builds up over decades, there tend to be more and more lipids trapped, more and more monocytes coming in, foam cells form, and that's when these monocytes are just overwhelmed and overburdened with the number of lipids that have been stuck in the artery that then causes them to die. They release all kinds of uh, foreign, perceived foreign uh, molecules, which just starts a whole inflammatory process. And this is what leads to that swelling lesion within the wall, eventually either occluding the artery or breaking through the endothelium and activating platelets that would be circling by and forming a clot. So how are ceramides possibly related with this basic concept of atherosclerosis? Well, it turns out that these plaques are highly enriched in ceramides. It also turns out that ApoB lipoproteins, so those that are known to be the, the most um, aggressive plaque-forming type lipoproteins in circulation, it turns out if they have an increased amount of ceramides in those lipoproteins, that they're more likely to be able to infiltrate the endothelial layer and get stuck, and they more likely aggregate when they're within that layer so that they cause more immunogenicity 
and are harder to be removed. And all of these data, starting back in the 90s and early 2000s, precede this untargeted study. Furthermore, ceramides upregulate all kinds of cytokines, which would contribute to drawing more immune cells and possible de-differentiation of the smooth muscle cells around the plaques in the arteries, and they're also <coughs> disruptive of nitric oxide signaling, which is responsible for vasodilation, vasoconstriction, and they're even known to activate platelets if they come in contact with ceramides. So all this data was more basic science literature predating this study, but it seemed to confirm those findings of ha uh, as having some sort of foundation and merit based in actual uh, scientific study. So then we decided, all right, we're going to make a mass spectrometry test. And what I'm showing you here is our very first attempt. And it was a simple idea of just diluting uh, some serum, shooting it through the mass spectrometer, and searching for those four ceramides we discussed. Those of you that are used to looking at chromatography, we were able to identify the four different ceramides. Unfortunately, there's such a disparity in the concentrations that are present that we had a very difficult time getting a linear response for all four species. Ceramide 18 is so, um, uh, such a small concentration that it tended to under-recover at the, at the bottom end of the, of the measured range, while these two ceramides, the 24, were so concentrated that they were, they were sort of saturating at the upper end. So we didn't think we'd be able to do a very robust quantitative method we tried a variety of different approaches to try and adjust for this. We did targeted MRM, we did uh, multiple dilutions, but really it came down to we didn't have the right equipment at the time. So we eventually settled on having to get uh, a newer mass spectrometer, which had a larger dynamic range. Uh, we settled on this method, which is fairly simple and straightforward. It only takes 40 microliters of plasma. We um, extract that with an ethyl acetate and isopropanol mix, do some reverse phase chromatography, and we're able to measure all four molecules with decent linearity in all four, despite their desperate uh, concentration ranges. We have a reasonable LOQ for all of them. And most importantly, we're decently precise. Now, uh, the low end still lacks a little bit there, around 11% for that one lowest concentration ceramide, but the individuals that are at risk have elevations, so they're closer into the 7% CV range. So that was our biggest concern, was making sure that we could create a test that was clinically robust to have reproducible results. Moving forward from then, when we now had this targeted test for the four different species, we wanted to evaluate more evidence for <coughs> clinical utility. So working with our collaborators, we had access to some samples from the Lyric study, which was 258 uh, subjects that had a cardiovascular death within three years of enrollment compared to the 187 controls that survived. And we found again that those three ceramides that we were measuring were highly predictive. Uh, the hazard ratio being uh, 1.5 about for all three of them, meaning that as per SD, it, uh, we would have a 150% chance of having uh, uh, an event compared to the, those that had a, a lower or more normal ceramide score. And this was even after adjusting for their cholesterol, whether or not they were on a statin, their age, their smoking status, and their BMI. So those remain predictive and the reason we put LPPLA2 on there is it's the plaque test is a trademark and cardiologists tend to use that uh, in the current world as their uh, go-to sort of new novel biomarker and we were showing that um, while it is predictive it's on a similar scale to these ceramides. So then a second study looked at about uh, 580 patients that had some very advanced uh, coronary imaging. So they did intravascular ultrasound and near-infrared spectroscopy. And they also measured ceramides by this method in the blood from those subjects. And they found that um, the elevated ceramides increased the chance of there being a necrotic plaque identified by these advanced imaging increased the lipid core burden, which is the amount of lipid in the plaques that were identified, 
And they were also significantly associated with the patients having a major adverse cardiovascular event within a year. So that's a stroke, heart attack, or a need for revascularization. So it's a bit of a softer endpoint compared to CV death, but uh, it so shows that not only was it associated with the imaging, but again, with events. And this time, ceramides were normalized to that fourth ceramide we were talking about, and we still maintain a, a fairly decent, significant odds ratio. So now we have two independent cohorts, in addition to that first uh, untargeted method. And then here in a third study, uh, this was a smaller one, just a case control, 80 cases, 80 controls. We found again that those three ceramides with their ratio to 24-0, in this case, were much more highly predictive of cardiovascular death. And this was after adjusting again for basic lipids and CRP in this case, which is another uh, biomarker often used in the cardiovascular space. In this group, there was a bit, they were still significant, but not quite as significant for the ceramide 18 in isolation. But when you use the ratio, it became very sharply and significantly <coughs> associated with having an event. So at this point, we had gathered some uh, samples from our own uh, biobank at Mayo, and these were all patients that had an elective coronary angiography for a variety of reasons. Some had unstable angina or just they showed up with chest pain so that they weren't certain what to do with it, took them to the cath lab and found that maybe they didn't have an actual MI, so that's what then would be diagnosed as unstable chest pain. Some were simply short of breath, some had ischemia as shown by electrocardiograms or, or other imaging modalities and some just had a very strong suspicion of a heart attack. We excluded any patient that had diabetes, uh, had a transplant, or had any prior uh, cardiovascular invasive procedure like a percutaneous intervention where they go in and place a stent or a cabbage where they redirect flow by inserting an artery to go around things. So those were all excluded as were patients with kidney disease or HIV. So we tried to make it a healthier population and you can see here that uh, about half of them actually had coronary artery disease identified when they went in and did this uh, elective angiography. And that those patients that did have coronary artery disease tended to be older, um, tended to have uh, more incidence of hypertension, and they were already on statins when they were enrolled. So measuring ceramides uh, and then following events for four years in, these group, in this group, we again identified 87 of those, uh, or 67 subjects had 87 events, 40 were death, 10 from CV, and then there were some strokes and PCIs. Again, ceramides were able to predict who was gonna have the events. And both the ceramides, the three we talked about, the 16, the 18, the 24 one, as well as their ratios to this non-informative one all are highly predictive of events. And this was after fully adjusting for age, sex, BMI, hypertension, smoking history, basic lipids, even their fasting glucose, and if there was any family history of coronary artery disease. We further adjusted for pretty much every biomarker we've ever looked at, since these, this is the, the patient study we keep in the freezer in the cardiovascular lab, so we can basically measure everything that uh, people are pushing or, or saying is the new, latest, and greatest and ceramides seemed to come out ahead of all of them. So at this point, we really thought we wanted to take this test uh, to the clinic, but the problem was we have these three different ceramides and their ratios, all of which seem to be informative. And then now we're gonna sit down at a clinician patient encounter and try to explain these results in a, a rational way. So we, were, we spent quite a bit of time going back and forth with our cardiology colleagues and trying to decide how would we show this? Should we give a normal reference range and if, say you're at risk if you're outside that range? Should we try to uh, identify uh, just how do we do make it more palatable? So what I'm showing here is in a shaded area, we did a, a normal value study um, from 240 patients that were ostensibly normal. And that shows what the normal range is for each of the ceramides or their ratios. And then the actual histogram is showing those 500 patients that we looked at that had the elective coronary angiography and we ended up seeing follow-up. And we're trying to show that there were quite a few patients that are outside that normal range 
We know that increased levels confer risk, but at what point should we say this is something that you should be worried about, this is something you should treat? And after many conversations going back and forth, we decided that we have these six parameters and rather than building some complex score or model like exists today in a lot of places, we would do a simpler score. So based on the normal values, we decided anyone with a, we, we came up with a 12 point scale. Anyone that had a value for it, these six different parameters that was at the median or less, no points. If you're in the third quartile, we give it a point. If it's in the fourth quartile, it's two points. So it's a simple score. Anybody could uh, look at the values and understand it. And you have a scale then of zero to 12 based on possible two points for each of the six parameters. Going back and looking at that cohort that we had from Mayo, if you were to parse out those patients according to their score and then look at their basic lipids, there isn't any trend. They don't go up or down based on the score. So we thought that might be a good thing. This holds true to being an independent additive uh, risk marker. And then if you look at the actual events from those patients, you can see that as the score goes up, the rate of events, the incident of events, number of events does seem to trend overall. It's not a big enough study that's to completely get rid of the noise. You can see there's some spaces here where we have about a 15% event rate and the same was true for if you had a score of two. So, but based on these data and some of the data that we're gonna keep showing you from bigger studies that we started to get involved with, uh, it was decided in concert with our cardiology colleagues to parse out the score into four categories. And this is more to be consistent with the way LDL is used right now. You have a desirable, borderline high, high, really high, that sort of a thing. So to go green, yellow, red, we went with lower, moderate, increased, and higher risk with the score of zero to two, three to six, seven to nine, and 10 to 12. So the whole idea here was to take what we thought was a promising new biomarker and give a more clinical spin to the tool that would be used in patient interaction between clinicians. Now, if we break down to those four, and I'm sorry my color scheme didn't match or follow through between figures, but <laughs> break it down into those four groups again. This is going back to our 500 elective coronary angiography patients at Mayo. Uh, you can see if we did a longer follow-up, and this was looking uh, Again, at all events, uh, included soft events, uh, revascularization and stroke. Those in the lower two categories the, had a similar risk uh, profile, and then those in the higher two categories really started to segregate out. And that segregation started early, within about five years, that those people were showing more events. So that was all Mayo Clinic data. At the same time, our, our Finland colleagues had also been working with um, other groups throughout Europe to get access to large sample banks. And they ended up uh, being able to test two large banks, each of about 1,600 uh, enrolled subjects. And they used the same classification scheme. And the first study, and these don't translate back to English well, so I just use their actual acronyms, BCAC and SPUM. Uh, the first study, BCAC, had about 1,600 patients, 81 CV deaths within five years. That was considered the outcome. And if you classify according to this risk stratification that we came up with on that 12-point scale, you can see that patients in the highest group had about 11% event rate compared to only 3% in the lowest group. And then the same is true, and this one was a one-year outcome follow-up in the ACS score, and it was about... 10% again versus 2 or 3% in the lowest category. So it seems to work. It now seems to translate across several different um, groups. Those were all subjects, though, that had some prior disease or suspicion of disease. So we really, um, this study, I think, is one of the, the more important ones that have come to date. And again, it was through the collaborators we have in Finland. They gained access to the FinRISC cohort. So this was just a population study where they would enroll all comers at, uh, and follow them for um, up to 25 years. And in this case, they had access to 8,000 samples 
and they measured the ceramides and then compared outcomes. And you can see again, breaking it down into these categories, low, medium, high, that we've come up with, that even amongst patients that had no prior suspicion necessarily in a primary prevention cohort, the high risk ceramides really identified those patients that are at more risk of having an event within the next 10 years. And the segregation started to be significant again around five years in. So we think it's a useful test. We show now that we think it'll definitely identify those that are at risk. The next question is how do we use this in the clinic? So we think we have a tool, we've created the tool, but what are we going to do to actually modify a patient's risk if we had this information available earlier on? So this is a case that was given to me by one of our cardiologists at Mayo. And it, he, I asked him to just sort of illustrate how you're going to use this. And he said, I can tell you not just how, but how I've been using it. And so this was an actual case. A uh, patient that had come in, he was a 58-year-old man. And the reason he came in to cardiology was because his older brother, who was only older by two years, just had a heart attack. And they had no prior history, no family history of any cardiovascular disease. So this gentleman now was quite concerned. Is it going to happen to me as well? At the time, he did have hypertension, but it was being controlled by some medication. Uh, he was considered obese on the BMI scale and had uh, significant abdominal girth. He didn't exercise a lot. He didn't eat well. I think this might cover, I know myself, uh, <laughs> I sit around more than I should and I drive through McDonald's more than anyone should. So his fasting blood sugar was a 106, which is kind of borderline. It's not, a, it's not diabetic, but it's getting there. Uh, lipids, you can see, are unremarkable. LDL of about 100. His HDL is it's decent. It could be higher, would be better. Uh, and if you plug these into the current ASCVD cardiovascular risk score, he comes out with a 10-year risk of 7.4%. And on the guidelines, that would fall into recheck again in a year or two. And it says that if your risk factors were optimal, your risk could be as low as 4.8%. And what they would uh, suggest in this particular case, since while his risk came out at one place as pretty low, the patient seems to have an increased level of anxiety and possibly an increased potential for motivation to make a change right now. So I think what I, what I find unique about our preventive cardiology practice is a lot of times they like to use bio, biomarkers as motivators because to them it's preventing that heart attack is really about motivating the patient to take their meds regularly, to exercise, to eat right. And if you can find a, a moment in a person's life to encourage that, that's useful. So in this case, he ordered a ceramides for the patient, came back as high risk, and that prompted him to then give him a treatment stat strategy of simple lifestyle change. No drug changes, no, no uh, you know, specific pharma pharmacotherapy changes, but they were going to encourage him to enroll in one of the um, uh, exercise intervention programs they had right there at Mayo since he was a local individual. And that's based on, again, some science that has been coming out in the, in the more basic research side, which shows that plasma ceramides are actually lowered significantly within just three months of aerobic exercise training. And this came out of a, a study group that has nothing to do with Zora or Mayo, and it was just people looking at ceramides and lipids, and they showed that both people with normal glucose tolerance and those with type 2 diabetes, with a fairly simple one hour, five days a week uh, regimen, could have a very significant drop in their ceramides. And they measured some that we currently measure as well as some others. And in all cases, they showed the drop was uh, statistically significant. So in this case, the patient came back in three months, had been going to the gym four times a week, lost a little bit of weight, had changed uh, his diet based on a book he had been reading, had his blood pressure controlled to the point where he no longer needed to take medication to keep it in, in check, Fasting glucose uh, was doing a little better. Really no major changes in his uh, basic lipid profile. 10-year risk was 7.4, dropped down to 5.8, and that's largely due to the hypertension and, and the weight loss. Follow-up ceramide score at this time was down to a 3. So still a moderate risk, enough to keep working, but you can see that the, the change in the score happens fairly rapidly, and it's on a decent scale, a 12 to a 3 be enough to motivate continued keeping after it sort of a thing. 
Getting back to the Mediterranean diet, this is another study that came and it had no affiliation with Zora or Mayo, again, so an independent group did a uh, post hoc look at the Predimed trial. This was a study conducted in Spain where they had an intervention of Mediterranean diet versus regular diet and followed subjects for five years. And you can see here that if they measured ceramides at baseline, those that had the control diet and had a score that was below the median had a certain uh, risk profile. And if they had the intervention diet and had that low risk uh, ceramide score, there was really no difference. The same was true if they had the intervention, but they had a high um, ceramide score, they had almost no risk or risk equivalent to those individuals that had the low ceramide score. Those that ended up having this, uh, the more traditional track of a high risk were those that had high ceramides but didn't take the Mediterranean diet. So really this uh, suggests that those that are going to benefit from the diet can be identified by this ceramide score. And that was another reason that um, our, our docs who are big believers in, in diet and lifestyle really wanted to be proponents of using this to motivate patients to change on that side. Uh, we have also done some smaller studies looking at how pharmacological inter, um, intervention can adjust your ceramide results. So there's been a couple studies. One looked at 24 individuals on simvastatin for 14 days. And you can see here that their LDL went down by about 40% for baseline and that these three ceramides that we know to be associated with disease reduced by about 20 25% from baseline in those 14 days as well. So statins, which are known to be a useful tool for lowering cardiovascular risk, will also lower your ceramides. Same is true of resuvastatin, which drops your, your LDL cholesterol by a significantly larger margin, uh, about 55%. It also dropped the ceramide levels by, by a reasonable percent. So again, these are smaller trials. They weren't targeted for ceramides in any way, but they show that this treatment that is already going to be used will impact ceramide levels as well. So, How is it doing that? I would uh, assume that it's because it's eliminating all of lipoproteins in circulation, and ceramides being lipids have to be part of those lipoproteins. But that's a good moment to start having questions because that's about all I brought today. So I hope I've uh, conveyed something about ceramides. They're Elevated in things that are associated with cardiovascular disease, like dyslipidemia, inflammation, and ischemia. We've developed a ceramide risk score, which we think is useful in both secondary and primary prevention and is independent and additive of currently, current biomarkers in use, and that there are several means by which you can try to impact a patient's ceramide values. With that, I will take questions. So, so you indicated right away you had the three ceramides that you looked at, and there were certain reasons for that. Given the complex nature of lipids and <laughs> things of that nature, and isomers, yes. was that taken into account when you selected those three? Because it looked like on your graph, on the volcano plot, there mm -hmm. were maybe ten more that gave a higher risk. Absolutely. Um, so it's the robustness of the test we felt we could come up with. I think if we went back and looked at those lipids that might have had more risk in that initial study, or even did this untargeted approach on all the different uh, sample sets we've looked at so far, we might be able to find better markers, certainly. But it was just the idea of what can we measure in a single method and hopefully be able to do reproducibly. So coronary artery scans. Uh, yeah, looking for oh, oh. We have not done any studies that had subjects with uh, the CAC scores, so I can't tell you yet. But that is a it's an upcoming biomarker, so to speak. It's in the guidelines now. It's really I think it's a useful tool, and that would probably be the next best thing for us to go after. <laughs> 
could you say a, a few words about the physiology of the Ceramide 24 colon zero? And the reason I'm asking that is it looks like it has a little bit different predictive value than the other ceramides. Yeah. Um, it wasn't associated with disease in most cohorts. Right. So it's very prevalent. It's in the you know five to ten um, nanomolar or micromolar versus the rest are in the nanomolar range. So physiologically, it's more common in membranes. In fact, I think it's a supplement they add to some beauty care products. To, <laughs> if you oh. Google ceramides, it's going to oh, show up. <laughs> So it's very it's prevalent in in, uh, in cell membranes, and I think okay. that it accounts for just uh, inter individual variation in ceramides. Is what we're using it for. It I can't have more specifics other than that. So very much a related question, mm -hmm. which is, do you have any biochemical insights into what is the normal or protective effects of that longer chain ceramide versus the pathologic effects of the shorter chain? Goes back again. I, I'm always confused when I listen to talk about polyunsaturated fats, saturated fats. I mean, everybody's got great epidemiologic data and associative data, but yeah. the biochemistry is always kind of a mystery to me. And I was wondering if there's any biochemistry, or is it also a mystery to me? It seems to be I, indicating it's, it's probably yeah. a mystery. to me, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but we have seen some data where uh, long chain fat, very long chain fatty acids, very uh, health, you know, right. like yeah. it's good for health. And But I don't think there's enough, like, uh, basic research of you know, or evidence to really say why is that. Yeah. And if you think about it at this, and this is going to be speculative. Speculative. <laughs> <laughs> um, if I can get to just a picture of these ceramides. The most common, they can be synthesized, you know, de novo all the way back, but the most common thing that happens is they simply tack on a free fatty acid, and I can't find my mouse on here. Yeah. Um, so it might just, like you are suggesting, be part of your dietary intake, and maybe it's a signal there that you're picking up on, because the fatty acid that gets tacked on is perhaps a long chain, and so if you're consuming more, or for whatever reason you're a type of person sure, that so makes it, it more. Actually, yeah, it's not necessarily positive, but it's indicative of <coughs> metabolism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you say a bit more about the correlation with cholesterol, total cholesterol, triglyceride, and ceramide levels? They're correlated somewhat, yeah. but um, when we made this score, that correlation fell apart as far as, as things went up in the score. And I think that had to do with then normalizing to the 24-0. But if you think about um, just plasma levels, Cholesterol and these ceramides being lipids and lipophilic, they have to be chaperoned through the bloodstream, so they're only going to be there in the context of a lipoprotein, just like cholesterol. So I think that's why the treatments that currently are known to lower cholesterol are in actuality, they're lowering lipoproteins, and that's why it also has an impact on these ceramides, if that makes sense. I think that before we could make any strong claims that it should be used, for instance, at the family practice or internal medicine level, we need to see a study that was interventional where they intervened based on ceramides, would be my suggestion. My other hope is that we've now opened up uh, avenues and possibly sparked interest from the pharma side that they would want to target ceramide synthases which there are uh, six that are sp spread out throughout different uh, physiological categories, and I think this could then be an alternative target even compared to cholesterol. I, oh, Tom. Sorry. Yeah. No, go ahead. Oh, okay. So I just have a question about, like, to me, though, I, I'm trying to understand, um, you know, you have three, actually six, those biomarkers, mm -hmm. right? So how correlated are they in terms of, their concentrations and then their ability to, you know, predict. Because to me, um, it, it seems that they're quite correlated. There's quite correlation. That's true. Them. Um, and 
it comes back to that epidemiological uh, studies versus an individual. And so on a group of 600 or 1,000 patients, they're all very highly correlated, but in any one individual, they maybe have more elevation in a specific single ceramide and not the others, which was our biggest concern in being able to have a decent sensitivity specificity, but also an interpretable output. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Another, another question. On, uh, so about your answer to my question. <laughs> the Finnish study, I think John Eckfeld showed me a paper a number of years ago uh, on maybe the same study, large Finnish study with thousands of people mm -hmm. who did a diet and intervention that had a really substantial mm -hmm. uh, effect. So it, it is, it, are those materials available that this could be done, or did the Finns already do that? When you say materials. Uh, the blood, I mean, this is the sample. Oh, for another dietary intervention study? Well, did they already do it? I mean, they, there was a large Finnish study. I only I care don't about know. this because I have two grandchildren. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the re our connection to Finland is that's where these researchers are from that right. first brought it up to us. I'm not aware, but uh, we can look into that. Maybe that was the Finn risk study. It, it may have been. Uh, mm -hmm. This was large. Because it may have been done mm -hmm. if they had assayed these, but you would think they would have. And actually, Finland is the only other place offering this test commercially. Things being what they are there, it's a patient can just walk in and ask for it. You don't have to have a doctor order it or anything. But it's the same test because we work with them on it. So sort of along those lines, has anybody looked at the Framingham samples? Yes, and I should have included it. Uh, hot off the presses just a, a few weeks ago, uh, Wash U measured ceramides in a different method there that wasn't affiliated with us at all, but they ended up measuring the same ceramides in the Framingham study and found prediction again. Their prediction is opposite because in their ratio they put the 24 on top. But it's there, and I, I can forward the paper to, the, to Danny to yeah. push around. Yeah, Jess. Have you done any sort of time course studies? It seems like at least the data that you show when you perform an intervention, mm -hmm. the ceramides drop dramatically, and the lipoproteins are stable. Mm -hmm. Have you ever done like a time course to see where those sort of normalize the you know, I guess what we call baseline level? We're working on it now. We're, some interventions like that. Just, again, small uh, studies where there's an inter exercise intervention and we have about 40 <laughs> patients or so. We're, we're doing another one that's actually, uh, we're looking at psyllium fiber, which is Metamucil, because apparently that lowers your LDL cholesterol as well. So we're doing those studies where we can. I've not been able to get access to any of the big trials where those data would just already be there and all it would be is a matter of measuring blood. Let's thank you, Jeff, for a great talk.